So I'm going to start off by talking about um, Cesare syndrome and mycosis and transform mycosis fungoides. I'm going to start out just with some definitions, show you some pictures of what it could look like. Um, there's obviously a lot of range in uh, individualization in these things. And then I'll try to get into some of the treatment strategies um, in a relatively general way and um, we can touch on prognosis. I always um, am nervous about talking about prognosis to groups in general because I'll repeat this a couple of times. Prognosis describes a probability. It describes that if you have 100 people with one situation, 20 this may happen, 20 this may happen, 30 this may happen. It doesn't tell you individually what's going to happen to you. And I think we hear these stories a lot. And I hope that the doctors aren't communicating this, but we hear it so much that we are, that, that people hear things like, oh, the median survival is 10 years. That means they're going to die in 10 years. No, that means some people will live shorter than 10 years. Some people will live longer than 10 years. And we don't know what's going to happen necessarily to that individual. So just to reiterate that, when we talk about prognosis, particularly with some of these topics, which can get into what we sort of call more advanced disease, and I'll talk about what that means, prognosis is not a fate. It's a probability. And that probability is often based on older data with different treatments. So um, we're optimistic that, that things are changing all the time. OK, so talk a little bit about Cesare syndrome. So Cesare syndrome is really just a somewhat arbitrary definition that if you have the cells that look like mycosis fungoides, we'll talk a little bit about whether it's exactly mycosis fungoides or not. And as Ellen was saying, those cells are mostly in the skin. And for most people, they'll be in the skin and they'll stay in the skin. They may move through the blood, but they'll only grow in the skin. There are some people that have more of those cells in the blood. And if you have enough of those cells in the blood, I'll show you the definitions of a certain level, then we call that Cesare syndrome. But when we look at someone's blood counts, this is what a pathologist, this is sort of a cartoon. These are red blood cells. These are something called neutrophils. This is something called a lymphocyte. It's labeled a B cell here. But when a pathologist looks at your blood smear, you see all these different cells. And people have normal white blood cells, and they have normal red blood cells. And what Cesare cells are is they're an abnormal lymphocyte, so a kind of white blood cell that looks sort of uh, has this is dark area as a nucleus. They have kind of a big nucleus. They have a certain unusual feature that a pathologist would recognize as that's abnormal. And if you look at that in the context of someone with mycosis fungoides or with a lymphoma, you would say that's morphologically, meaning that's what it looks like, that's a Cesare cell. And if you look really carefully at anyone's blood who has mycosis fungoides, you may find a few cells that would be Cesare cells. It doesn't mean you have Cesare syndrome, it just means you have some cells in the blood. We define it a little more specifically now. This hopefully is not too technical, but just I'll just explain how we get to Cesare syndrome. So when we look at those cells in the blood, you, you can look back and see, do they look sort of big and abnormal? And those might be abnormal cells, and they might be cancer cells in the blood. We then do what's called immunohistochemistry or flow cytometry, which is really the way we know that a cell is a Cesare cell is you can look at it and see that it's a lymphocyte. But then you can tag it or label it with antibodies. So they're just little proteins that stick to the outside of a cell, and they stick to the outside of a specific feature on a cell. So say we know that Cesare cells have CD4. That's just the name of something on their surface, right? We label the, surf, the features on the surface of cells as CD, cluster designation. It's just, a, it's just words. And then they get a number roughly in order with when they were first discovered. So there's CD1, there's CD290. Most T cells of mycosis fungoides are CD4. So they kind of got in on the ground floor of the CDs. Their T cells are low numbers, two, three, four, eight. And if you have those CD4 cells, there's just a technique where you can stick a protein on the surface, and that protein is attached with a little bit of a fluorescence or a light source. And then you can flow your blood. That's why it's called flow. The blood moves across a little scanning light source. And you can count the number of cells that you're looking for that have that feature. And you can count the number of Cesare cells. Does that kind of make sense? I always feel like I lose people, but see if you're with me. Um, and you get, just so you know what some of the data looks like, and this is more complicated. You get kind of what we call these scatter plots. And you can look, I can't read it from here. Um, so this is CD26, which is on a lot of normal T cells. And this is CD4, which is on a lot of normal T cells. Just take my word for it. Most Cesare cells are CD4 positive. That means they'd be up in this top part of the graph. And CD26 negative, that means uh, they would uh, be over here on the left side of the graph. So in this particular person's blood, this right here are a group of cells and there's actually individual dots there that are CD4 positive, CD26 negative, and that would be that person's Cesare cell population. That's a pretty specific pattern of markers. 
And if the number of those cells reaches a certain level, we call that Cesare syndrome. If those cells are there but below that level, then you have Cesare cells in your blood, but you don't have Cesare syndrome. So it's a little bit of an arbitrary definition that if it's at a certain level, we call it Cesare syndrome. So it kind of can exist in a spectrum with people that don't have Cesare syndrome but have some Cesare cells in the blood. Kind of make sense? Okay. And these are just the definitions that people agreed upon based on experience, based on looking at what happened to people. And it's called B classification or B staging. So for your skin, you get a different classification for B, which stands for blood. B0 means you don't have Cesare cells in your blood. Truthfully, if we look in, even in a normal person, you might find a few. Um, I don't want to say normal, not the right word. Even in a person without mycosis fungoides, everybody's normal. Even in a person without mycosis fungoides, by those definitions, it's so specific, you can find a few cells that can meet the criteria for Cesare cells. Doesn't mean they have Cesare syndrome, doesn't mean they have lymphoma. B2 means you have a lot of those cells. And there's some different definitions of that, which I don't really want to get into, but basically, the simplest one is if you have more than 1,000 cells per unit of measure that we measure things in the blood, we call that Cesare syndrome. And if you're in between B0 and B2, we call that B1. So part of the reason I'm telling you this detail is what I would like you to understand is that Cesare syndrome is an arbitrary line that was drawn for the purposes of collecting and reporting data. We do call Cesare syndrome more advanced disease because if you have a lot in your blood, you have a higher stage. You have more disease outside of your skin than people who have it only in the skin, and that gets into how we treat. But you can also understand that if we draw the line at 1,000, if someone has 950 cells in their blood, that doesn't mean that nothing bad could ever happen to them. And if someone has 1,002 cells in their blood, that doesn't mean that all is lost. It's just a line that was drawn so we can classify, so we can understand, put patients in certain groups in thinking about how we treat and how we learn to make better treatments. Kind of make sense? Okay. What does it mean to a person? Because you don't feel 1,000 cells in your blood, you don't feel 100 cells in your blood. Truthfully, you probably don't feel 5,000 cells in your blood. That doesn't affect the way you feel. But most people with Cesare syndrome have what we call erythroderma. And erythroderma means red, red erythroderma skin. So they have red skin. And the definition of erythroderma is that your skin is red about 80% or more of your skin, and it's often diffusely red, it's often itchy, it's often scaly. And in people with Cesare syndrome, that's what they feel. That's the impact on the quality of life, not the cells in the blood. You can get thickening on the, called keratoderma. I'm not a dermatologist, sorry, I'm a medical oncologist, so you'll have an actual dermatologist talking to you in a minute. Um, keratoderma uh, is thickening and kind of scaling of the palms and the soles, and that can often be uncomfortable. That's common in people with Cesare syndrome. It can affect function because if your skin on your hands is thick and scaly, you use your hands a lot similar with your feet, that can be an area where there's more symptoms, even though it's, it's a relatively small amount of skin. We talk a lot about these days of the spectrum, a Cesare syndrome being in the spectrum of mycosis fungoides, or is it really a different disease? And I think the answer that's evolving is it's probably both. There are people that have typical mycosis fungoides that over time might get worse, and they might develop enough cells in the blood to call it Cesare syndrome. Some of those people started with patches or plaques that are more typical. And then there's people that really start with Cesare syndrome, that at diagnosis they have a lot of cells in the blood. And when we look at sort of very t fancy tests looking at um, what we call mutational profiling, looking at the abnormal genes in the cancer cells, it looks like the people that start with Cesare syndrome probably have a different disease. So I think often Cesare syndrome is called the leukemic variant of mycosis fungoides, meaning it's mycosis fungoides in the blood. Probably sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's really a separate disease that just shares a lot of similar features in terms of the abnormal cells. Right now, that's not making a tremendous amount of difference in terms of how we treat. But at this conference that we just had, and, and, and a lot of our new treatments are directed at um, what we call mutational targets in the cells, or targeting specific abnormal genes. And once you're targeting specific genes, not cells in general, then it does become more relevant. And I think what we're starting to learn and we'll learn over time is that some treatments are uh, maybe better or worse for Cesare, and they may not all be the same list as with mycosis fungoides, um, though that's a little bit for the future. To me, the most relevant part of having Cesare syndrome is that it just means you have extracutaneous disease. So you have disease outside the skin. 
most people who have disease in the skin, you can address that most safely with skin-directed therapy. You can put things on your skin. You can expose things like light or radiation to the skin. If you have significant disease outside the skin, then we have to address that with a medicine or a treatment that goes inside the body. And to me, that's the most significant difference is if you have disease inside the body, we have to treat with disease inside the body. We can't only treat the skin. And that probably has a lot of impact in terms of the likelihood you're on a medicine and all our medicines cause some side effects. Um, the treatment strategies really fall from having disease outside the skin. As I said, most of the symptoms are related to the skin. We also, like Ellen said, have a multidisciplinary clinic where I work side by side with dermatologists. And one of the most important things that's going to help people feel better or feel okay is good skin care and good skin treatment. So even though there's disease in the blood, the symptoms are from the skin, feeling better will have a lot to do with getting good skin care. And our goal for, sorry, I'm struggling with the pointer, for mycosis fungoides in general, and it still holds for most people with Cesare syndrome, is we want to find the least toxic therapy to control the disease and the symptoms. The difference is when you have Cesare syndrome, on that list of least tox toxic therapies is going to include medicines and procedures that address inside the body. It's not just going to be putting something on your skin. And air quotes around mild systemic. So we have mild systemic therapies. I'll talk about some of those, often in conjunction with skin-directed therapies. Um, and I'll show you what some of those treatments are. Prognosis, again, as I said, I don't like talking about prognosis in front of groups. I really don't like talking about it in individuals because I, I find it not that helpful, <laughs> um, the prognosis um, for an individual. But what I would say is when you have Cesare syndrome, the probability that this is going to be a more serious health problem at some point is higher than if you don't have Cesare syndrome as if you had it just in the skin. doesn't mean it's going to happen. It doesn't mean it's going to happen soon. But over time, it's more likely to happen. So we have to pay attention to it, and we have to treat. Um, if it's happening, we have to adjust our treatments. Does that kind of make sense? I think a lot of times people, like as Ellen was saying, we, we sort of manage this over time. And I think people think, oh, if I have advanced disease or disease outside the skin, that means we don't manage it over time you still would try to manage it as safely as possible over time. It just means the likelihood that you're successful in that is a little bit lower. You may have to change treatments more, but you could still be on a mild treatment that could still control it for years. And right now, we don't have a way of predicting whether or not that's going to happen other than trying something and seeing. So to a certain extent, you still take it as it comes, but you really look for the mildest therapy to control the disease and keep you well in almost all cases. So these are some of the treatments that I listed uh, for Cesare syndrome. So again, I'm just going to keep going back to good skin care. Just because the disease is inside the body, the symptoms are mostly from the skin, and that's going to be important. In terms of our milder systemic therapy, we often start um, with oral medicines when we're treating inside the body. Targretin, or the generic name Bexerotine, uh, is one of those. This is a retinoid. Interferon is something that you take as a shot. It kind of stimulates the immune system. And for Cesare syndrome in particular, there's a treatment called photophoresis, which that's where it has its best results. And that's a treatment where you're basically exposing the blood to ultraviolet light, almost like a phototherapy for the blood. Those cells are reinfused. And that's often done in combination with mild systemic therapies. So these are medicines that you take at home. This is a procedure that you have. I think I've burned out the pointer. Photophoresis is a procedure that you've ha you have two or four days a month. So it's a procedure, something you go and have. Um, blood comes out of your body hooked up uh, to a machine. It goes through a bath, goes back into your body. It takes a couple hours. Um, and those are treatments for Cesare syndrome. If those treatments work, those are treatments that can be given long term without accumulation of toxicities. And the words we use is you could treat someone until progression or intolerance, meaning as long as it's controlling the disease, it's not getting worse. As long as you tolerate it, you can be on those treatments, and those could last for years. So even though Cesare syndrome would be uh, prognostically more concerning, there are people who have great disease control long term on those. Other treatments that we have include slightly less mild systemic treatments, so something called histone deacetylase inhibitors, Istadex or Romadepsin, that's the, the brand name, that's a, uh, the generic name, um, is intravenous, Zalinza varinostat is oral. Those are other medications that we can use. Some people will get uh, low doses of methotrexate, which is chemotherapy, but in this situation, it's usually given in low pill doses, and those are all alternate treatments. And mostly, we'll give these things sequentially. We would have a conversation. We'd start with what makes most sense for you. 
again, going back to that principle, the least toxic therapy that may get us where we want to go. If that works, great. If it's not working as well as we want, we add to it, we change the dose, we switch. And those are often dynamic decisions that are made over time based on how you're doing. There's a monoclonal antibody. So this is a protein that binds to a marker on a lot of white blood cells, including lymphocytes, called Campath or Alemtuzumab. This is something that was taken off the market for financial reasons, but it is available, and it does have particularly good activity in people with Cesare syndrome. Much higher side effect profile than some of the other treatments in that it causes a uh, strong suppression or weakening of the immune system. So that is something that can often work well, but isn't something that you can be on for years and years and years. It was something you'd be on for a finite period of time, usually a month or two, then you might stop, then you might go back to it. Um, and then, of course, transplantation, which I throw up there, though. Um, if you go through this long list of treatments, all of them, most of them, there's some others that I didn't list. And it really looks like you're not one of the people who the disease is going to be safely managed over long term. Then we start thinking about, are there reasons to get rid of this permanently? And right now, that includes a bone marrow or stem cell transplant from another person, which is medically about the most aggressive thing you can do to somebody, but it can work. But because of that and the risk involved with that, most people get a lot of those upper treatments first, and most people get pretty long-term disease control with one of those treatments before getting down to the bottom of the list. Right. Switch over to large cell transformation. It's a little bit of the same story, just in a slightly different version. Okay. So large cell transformation um, is, a, is a pathology term. I'm going to start out with something that I think confuses people sometimes. To have large cell transformation of mycosis fungoides, you have to also have mycosis fungoides. So this is something in people with mycosis fungoides where some of the cells, what we sometimes call a subclone, or some of the cells in the body transform and change their growth rate and look different under the microscope. If you don't have mycosis fungoides, you can't have large cell transformation of mycosis fungoides. The mycosis fungoides has to come first. The definition of histologic transformation, histology means what the pathologist sees under the microscope, is the evolution of a clinically indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to a clinically aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? That's just the definition. Indolent means slow growing over time. Aggressive, when we use that word in lymphomas, is growth rate. Aggressive lymphomas are fast growing. It doesn't mean they're not treatable. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily deadly. It just means that they're faster growing. And when the pathologist looks under a microscope, they see cells that are bigger and dividing more often. And that's what's called histologic transformation. So that means that that's what the pathologist sees. Again, what does this not mean? It's not a fate. It's a probability. When we see faster growing lymphomas, we know they have the potential to grow faster. So what does that mean? That means that if the treatments aren't working well, you might find that out sooner. That if, if the disease is going to progress, it might progress sooner. And it's something that you have to watch. It doesn't mean it will. It just means the chance that that could happen is higher than if you didn't see that. Again, arbitrary definitions. It's defined as 25% of the cells are large cells. It's not like if you have 24% of your cells in your biopsy are large cells, that that means everything is fine. And if you have 27, all is lost. People just made a cutoff because you have to define something to study it and talk about it. So people made a cutoff. And it's not completely arbitrary, but it's pretty arbitrary. Again, what does that mean when the pathologist looks under the microscope? I'll try to show you. This is probably a normal lymphocyte. This is a normal. They're kind of small. They have this really dark center. And then a large cell is sort of big. If you can see, the center is sort of light and dark. Those are just like abnormal features. So on this biopsy, you see more of these big, f what we would call funny looking cells, and less of these sort of small, more normal looking lymphocytes. So if, if they look at all the lymphocytes, the pathologists, and they don't really count, they kind of just gestalt it. They're like, that looks like 35%. Then they'll say it's large cell transformation. Um, it's not that counting would be better. It's just, it's an impression. This is a marker of CD30. So one of the new drugs we have targets CD30, and that's one of the uh, Etcetras or Brentuximab vidotin is a sort of a very effective new drug that we have. It's approved for other non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, other T-cell lymphomas in Hodgkin lymphoma, and there's been recent data that it's quite effective in some people with mycosis fungoides. And one of the features of large cell transformation is the big cells often, not always, but often pick up this CD30 marker on their surface. That's the brown stain here on the outside of cells, that's CD30. 
So large cell transformation is not necessarily a good thing, but it does often provide other treatment opportunities, sometimes because it upregulates or you increase the expression of CD30. And what does large cell transformation look like in a person? Often we find it in a tumor. So this is a lump. This is a person that has other disease, and this is a tumor. So that's a lump. One area grew faster than another. Raise the question to the doctor, huh, is this the same thing? You do a biopsy and you see large cell transformation. So in this case, the faster growth rate seen under the microscope correlated with faster growth of a tumor in the person. Sometimes we see large cell transformation in relatively limited looking a disease. You don't necessarily have large tumors. And in cases like this, you might arbitrarily, from a biopsy here, see 25% large cells. That's not necessarily prognostically worse. It's concerning. We would note it. But sometimes the clinical and the pathology don't fit. Meaning here, we're like tumor, larger cells. That kind of goes together as this is something growing a little faster. Let's think about getting after it. Here, really not that different skin. Does this person really need a different approach because the pathologist sees 27 or 30 percent large cells? You'd have to see in that individual, does that make sense and is that needed? So just to repeat some of those things, large cell transformation is a histologic under the microscope and somewhat arbitrary uh, definition. It alerts the doctor that there is the potential for the disease to grow faster. That's called more aggressive growth, which just means it grows faster. And when people have large cell transformation, the potential for the disease to grow outside the skin is higher. So when people without transformed disease, just on the skin, the likelihood of it going inside the body or going outside the skin is relatively low. If you have transformed disease in the skin, it doesn't mean it's going to grow outside the body, but the possibility that that could happen now or in the future has gone up. What does that mean to the doctor? We got to look. We got to pay attention. We can't just look at your skin if there's a chance inside the body. We have to do a scan and see. If it's inside the body, we address it. If it's not, then we can just follow. We kind of say we were talking about, Ellen mentioned the NCCN guidelines, so we write the guidelines and we talk about, you know, guidelines are hard to write because you're trying to give guidelines for doctors in general with different levels of knowledge and understanding to use. And they're being used more and more by insurance companies sort of to follow use. We, we sort of joke that, um, right, uh, the guidelines, not rules. Drunk driving, that's a rule. Drunk dialing, that's a guideline. So. <laughs> These don't tell you exactly what you have to do. They try to put you in the ballpark of what's good and maybe not so good ideas. So we joked about how do you explain that? Because transform mycosis fungoides, it can be bad except when it's not. And trying to write in a very limited sense for a doctor who doesn't have necessarily that much experience this, when it's bad and when it's not, is really, it's really hard to do. So we just try to raise the issue that this can be a higher growth rate. You want to pay attention, but it doesn't necessarily mean a fate. You don't have to necessarily do a wholesale change in your treatment plan unless the disease in that individual warrants it. Because the transformed or the faster growing part of the disease can be more dangerous, your goal is to initially control that part of the disease. If it's a single tumor or single area on the skin that's transformed and the rest of the disease is not transformed, you could radiate that spot, make it go away, and you now don't have transformed mycosis fungoides. The fact that your lymphoma did that once does mean there's a higher chance it would do it again. Doesn't mean it's going to do it again, it just means a higher chance. So if it's a single spot or a single, a couple tumors, it doesn't necessarily fundamentally change your management. Sorry, I'm just trying to point, but I'm not. If you have multiple areas of the skin that are transformed, then we have to look at a way of controlling what's potentially more aggressive disease in the whole skin. And often that's with total skin radiation, though it could also be with medicines. And if there's transformed disease outside the skin in lymph nodes or organs, then that's something that we really have to address with medicines because we don't have a, another good way of treating more extensive disease if it's multiple places um, inside. Just like with Cesare syndrome, it's a chance that this is, disease is going to be harder to control long term. It doesn't mean it's going to be harder to control, but you still go through your sort of progression of different treatments. You talk about what makes sense. And if in that individual you learn that you cannot control it safely long term, and you have to learn that. You don't know that from the get-go. You have to learn that by trying and seeing. Then we think about strategies to try to get rid of it. Because this is not something that in an uncontrolled state you can just sort of, uh, I think as Ellen said, peacefully coexist. This is something that we have to control it or we need to try to get rid of it. And the treatments, these are just a snapshot from the NCCN guidelines. The treatments for transformed mycosis fungoides, there's not a lot of studies in this, tend to be chemotherapies, partly because we have more experience with those in aggressive T-cell lymphomas, and we know where they work. And there's not much difference between transformed mycosis fungoides 
and some of the more aggressive T-cell lymphomas. So brentuximab, vedotinib, et cetera, that I mentioned, there's a number of single-agent chemotherapies. You still would try some of these milder single-agent treatments, and then I'm getting the signal. I'm, I'm almost done, too, so thank you. Um, no, I, I asked to be, because I talked too much to someone to stop me, so we don't take Dr. Hodek's time. Um, if you can't go to that, then there are treatments we use for other uh, more aggressive T-cell lymphomas, which is like combination chemotherapy. And then again, if we really all understand that this is not going to safely be controlled and there's motivation, this is a situation where we do think about transplantation. But that's not usually your first. So I think this is my last slide. Um, again, we talk about Cesare syndrome and transform mycosis fungoides. More advanced disease, you can use those terms for this. That refers to stage, usually disease outside the skin or tumors or something a higher stage. More aggressive disease refers to growth rate. And the growth rate tells you not that it's necessarily a problem, but that it's more likely to be a problem if it's not adequately treated and controlled. So you still can treat it and control it, but you need to do that. Um, prognosis, again, is a probability, not a fate. The treatment strategies really need to be individualized, particularly when we get to the disease that has a potential to be more dangerous. Usually, we'll still try to safely control long term, though with these diseases, it tends to be with medications in addition to skin care. It tends not to be skin-directed therapy only. And often, you'll go through a first, second, third, et cetera round of that. And if you can control it long term, you can stick with that. If it becomes clear that that's really not working, then there is the possibility to think about trying to get rid of it. But that's a very individual and a pretty big decision. Do you have any recommendations on how to recover from peripheral neuropathy due to chemotherapy? Um, Dr. Horowitz's question. Yeah, there, there aren't great treatments, so um, mostly it's time. We know that when nerves are injured from chemotherapy, they heal very, very slowly, and that healing can be over months and sometimes up to a year or more before you get maximum recovery. So most of it is time. There are medications that can reduce the discomfort of neuropathy, so they can sort of blunt the feeling. Pain medication, some of the anti-seizure drugs do that. There's some studies of some other medicines to try that, but they're mostly addressing the, um, the sensation, not actually the nerve recovery. So it's mostly time and avoiding further injury to the nerves. People have experimented with things like certain vitamin supplementations and stuff like that. It's not clear that that really speeds the recovery. Um, is there a correlation between uh, people that have, you know, early stage MF and uh, autoimmune disease? Do you find this in your practice? Um, I'm trying to think how to answer. So I think the, the short answer is no, um, that most of the true increased incidence in lymphomas that is associated with autoimmune disease have been B-cell lymphomas. And some of it has been therapy related. So there's a couple of very rare scenarios, not mycosis fungoides, where treatments for autoimmune disease may cause other lymphomas. That being said, I think people who have autoimmune disease um, and see doctors a lot probably get things noted and biopsied earlier, and there may be some association there. We do see some general increase in other health issues in people with early stage mycosis fungoides, and at least to me, it's not clear that that is earlier diagnosis or more thorough diagnosis versus a true association of an increased incident. This is for Dr. Horowitz. Um, four or five years ago, I was diagnosed with mycosis fungoides. Um, then I was diagnosed with LYP. Then it went to CD30 disease. And I was just diagnosed with folliculotropic. And now my mycosis fungoides is transformed, according to biopsies. Um, I'm supposed to be heading back to Cleveland to um, get serious chemotherapy and then go into a autologous stem cell transplant. And I'm wondering, is there some other thing that I should do before I actually go? And they say autologous because of my age and finding a donor. That's a hard one. Um, I'll start off. Autologous means a stem cell transplant from your own stem cells. I'll start off with that. Um, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I flew back last week for game two of the World Series. <laughs> I have a plane ticket for Wednesday for game seven, should it go that far. Um, so hopefully I'll be back in Cleveland. Well, hopefully it won't be necessary, but otherwise I'll be back in Cleveland next week also. Um, that's a really hard one. Um, and it's a hard thing to answer from a podium to an individual person. But, but what I would say is what you're describing are a number of diseases where there's some overlap. 
So I think the question is, what my advice would be, everybody just needs to be super sure we know what we're dealing with. Mycosis fungoides, when it transforms, more large cells, more CD30 positivity. LYP is CD30 positive, can sometimes have large cells, lymphomatoid papillases. CD30 positive cutaneous lymphoproliferations, which by that would either be lymphomatoid papillosis or what we call primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, also has CD30 positivity in large cells. And there are people who have mycosis fungoides with large cell transformation expressing CD30, and there are people that have more than one thing. So all that being said, I would say with that approach, it's important to understand because uncontrolled transform mycosis fungoides is dangerous. Primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma is much less likely to be dangerous and might not need that type of treatment. Um, and in general, though the data is very limited, when autologous transplant has been done, the goal of that is remission for a period of time, but usually doesn't get rid of it forever. So the more powerful but also more dangerous treatment is a donor transplant. So that would be undertaken in a situation where I would think there would be aggressive disease that wasn't well controlled, and the goal of that is to really knock it down. Um, and that may be an appropriate thing to do. But I would just, I think, I think the pathology has to really be thought about and checked and everyone has to understand that we really understand what we're dealing with and that there isn't a different way. And I, and I assume your doctors have kind of been through different treatments and things like that. So that may be the case, but it's, that's a real tough situation to give really sort of specific guidance on, on those things.